Okay. <clears throat> Since um, it's before 12, so I can say to you good morning and welcome to this workshop on anti-discrimination policies and how it connects with diversity. So my first request is, please come closer. We are not gonna bite you. It's very, it's very nice that we can look into each other's eyes and talk about it. Please come closer, please. Don't sit so far away. <clears throat> I know I... Uh, <laughs> well, these are reserved for you. <laughs> okay. My name is Bashi Qureshi, and I would be chairing this session on the issue of anti-discrimination. Before I give word to these three eminent speakers who, are, who have many years of experience in their own field, let me just say a few words about the history of anti-discrimination in European Union because lots of people really don't know or don't have the knowledge of what happened in the, in the formation of European Union and how anti-discrimination was ignored. You all know that European Union started as a community for cooperation be, uh, you know, uh, between two countries and it evolved into economical development and later it became European Union. But most of you will be wondering why European Union until Amsterdam Treaty never had one word in any EU treat, uh, EF treaty about anti-discrimination, not one word. Even on the labor market issues, the social charter of European community did not have protection for ethnic minority workers who were coming from other countries and living here. And that situation was so terrible that many NGOs and individuals, among them Jan Nissen, who later became the, the chair of Migration Policy Group, we were going from one country to another country for 10 years, from 1986 to 1996, just to convince any country to take this issue up with the European Commission and Council of Europe, and it didn't work. But in 1996, luckily, the Irish presidency helped NGOs and asked us to come up with three lines, no more, no long speeches, just three lines, so that they can recommend to Council of Europe, uh, so the Council of Ministers. And that is how the Article 13 in Amsterdam Treaty came about. It was a long, hard struggle of people from NGOs who made this happen. It was not European countries or commission or even parliament who ever thought of that. So when that article became the part of treaty, then the commission realized that NGO could do some good work and then they asked those NGOs, please get together and make a network so that you can give us some feedback from the ground what is happening with anti-discrimination and the protection of minorities. And that is how my organization, ENAR, which is European Network Against Racism, was established to give advice to the European Commission. And later you will hear a little bit in more in detail what ENAR does on the anti-discrimination. But Article 13 became the father and the mother of anti-discrimination in European Union. And the 2000 directives on equality and discrimination comes from that. And then in Lisbon Treaty, it became Article 19. So I think it's very important to understand what has been missing and how it became what it is today. Now, for the last one and a half day, you have heard from uh, migration integration and how it, uh, it uh, incorporates into diversity, but it is also very important that these two issues are, whether these two issues are separate or not, that's a discussion, we can, we can take it up, but how the policies in different countries are impacting on the whole issue of diversity. Uh, we have four speakers here, 
on my left, actually they are sitting on my left. So Mrs. Du, she is from the Migration Policy Group, and she is going to talk not about everything, what their findings are, but only on anti-discrimination and how it relates to diversity and is it working or it's not working. And then we have Andreas, my dear friend Andreas. I'll uh, introduce him a little more later. He is um, German. He is um, uh, a researcher, and he, il, he will talk about from NGO perspective, where, what NGOs understand of their finding, but also what is happening on the ground in all EU countries. And then, to make it more specific, we have Karen, who would bring to you the experience from Vienna. I know that uh, what is happening in Austria is not very nice, many times, right from the 90s, but Karen has done what she could do in the city of Vienna to bring some sense to those politicians and policy makers. So with these, and, and another thing which is very important, I mean, I'm not gonna give them half an hour or an hour, they were going to have 10, 12 minutes max, so that you have time to ask them questions, because I believe in interactive uh, you know, workshops and interactive seminar instead of a host of speakers come and dish out a lot of information which you forget when you walk out of the door. So I will, I will sit down and I will ask uh, Mrs. Daw to, to come on the podium. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm really pleased today to be here to present the uh, main findings of my pastry in the area of anti-discrimination. I'm the legal policy analyst at the Migration Policy Group, and um, for that purpose, um, I'm going to provide you my expertise on anti-discrimination. Um, so, first of all, directly straight into the subject, um, very quickly, because um, I guess that that has been presented before already, what does MIPEX measure in the field of anti-discrimination? It measures whether all residents um, have equal rights, and uh, it also measures whether those migrants are or not discriminated against on the grounds of racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, and nationality. Uh, what we look up here, we look at the legal conditions of migrants. So we look at the legal framework. And so what MIPEX measures is not the practice, but it's what the legal framework is. Um, the MIPEX um, has been built up around uh, um, higher standards. So the benchmark is made against higher standards, which were drawn from international conventions, such as the uh, UN Convention on the Protection of Rights of All Migrant Workers, but mainly on the basis of the EC anti-discrimination directive. So we have two directives um, in force now in the EU, the Racial Equality Directive, which applies in uh, different fields, uh, such as employment, education, social protection and social advantages, access and supplies, um, well, goods and services and healthcare. And we also have um, a directive um, covering religion and belief in the field of employment. So um, we, the MIPEX was uh, built around indicators uh, which were aggregated around um, four dimensions. So we have the definitions and concepts, which means that here uh, we measure whether um, anti-discrimination legislation uh, were giving definition on, for example, direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, whether it applies to public and private sectors, uh, whether multiple discrimination is covered um, in the fields of application, whether the different fields I mentioned, I mentioned earlier were covered by anti-discrimination legislation um, on the three grounds, so national and ethnic origin, religion or belief, and nationality. Um, for enforcement mechanisms, um, we, here measures, uh, we here measure whether the access of justice, is there an access to justice? Is there effective enforcement? Do anti-discrimination legislation provide for alternative procedures such as mediation? What are the means of evidence that can be brought to courts? Um, are there assistance um, and legal aids provided to victims of discrimination? 
um, what, kind, uh, what types of action, legal actions are available and what types of sanctions can be applied. Um, so that's for the enforcement mechanisms. And then finally, MIPEX measures uh, equality policies. So here, um, on the basis of the EC directives, where um, one of the main requirements was to create specialized national bodies, promoting equality and, um, and also providing assistance to victims. So here we will measure the mandates given to those national equality bodies. So here is the, um, a table with the overall performance in the EU and also in North America because uh, with, the, with MIPEX3, um, the US um, was included in the, um, in the study together with Bulgaria and Romania as well because um, the, with the last MIPEX2, uh, they were not yet part of the EU because that was in 2007 and the date of their accessions was uh, on the 1st January 2007. So what we can see here um, straight on is that Can Canada and the US rank first. Um, so um, although we have EU law, and as uh, Thomas Hodgson has said earlier um, today, uh, those two EC directives constitute landmarks um, in Europe and were really progressive uh, tools um, for, to, to fight against uh, discrimination. Models are still yet to be found outside the EU. So Canada and the US are still models because they, they, you can see here that the um, their, their score is really high uh, with 89. Um, we see also from there that uh, Romania and Bulgaria, who acceded the EU only in 2007 and had to catch up, um, caught up very quickly and um, very, uh, that's a very positive sign. Bulgaria, both Bulgaria and Romania are part um, of the top 10. Um, one area of weakness that we can see uh, if you look into my tree is regarding nationality. The two EC and anti-discrimination directives do not cover nationality because according to the EC treaties, um, only EU citizens are protected. Uh, and, 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 and nationality is a protected ground only for EU citizens. So it means that for countries, um, national member states, which have nationality included either in their constitution or in their anti-discrimination legislation will get a higher score, which is the case for the UK. Uh, in the UK, you have um, an explicit uh, reference to citizenship in the, in the national legislation. Same goes for Portugal and Belgium. And then we see that the countries which um, have, one, well, which are, have a bad score um, are countries where you have nationality being explicitly excluded from anti-discrimination legislation. That's the case for Malta, that's the case for Italy, Luxembourg and Greece. And you see that they're among um, the, the last ones in the ranking. Um, we also see that um, the last six countries um, are the countries who um, opted for a very minimalistic approach uh, with regard to the implementation of EC directives. Um, if you look here, um, since, 2000, since 2000, with the adoption of the anti-discrimination anti directives, all countries have slightly or considerably improved legal conditions for migrants. Um, before 2000, 2000, only six countries had um, comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. Um, all countries had to implement the directives by 2003 for the so-called old member states, by 2004 for the new member states, and by 2007 for Bulgaria and Romania. Here we can see that countries which, doesn't have, which don't have a full implementation of the EC directives, namely Poland, Latvia and Spain, score very badly, and the same for the countries which have opted for minimum implementation, such as Austria, Malta and es Estonia. So here we see how a full implementation of the EC directives can um, significantly improve your score in MIPEX. 
Let's take the example of Spain, for instance. Spain has an overall score of, um, for the moment, um, 49, which is like far beyond, um, above, uh, under national EU, uh, the EU average. So um, there's a new legislation now being tabled. It, it was tabled at the beginning of the year in, uh, in Spain in order to improve the um, legislation in the area of anti-discrimination in Spain. If we look um, at the areas where, or the, for the indicators where changes will be made, uh, this is already very promising. We see that for the definition of, um, the, of the terms of discrimination, um, for the moment, Spain scores zero uh, because they, there is no definition on discrimination by association, for example. With the new, with the new law, uh, that would be improved, and so Spain will get a score of 50. Uh, same goes for enforcement uh, mechanisms. With the new law, there will be mediation be introduced in the alternative dispute resolution procedures for which now Spain receives a score of zero. And also the uh, shift in burden of proof for the moment applies only in judicial procedures. And with the new law, that will be introduced in also under administrative procedures. So here, Spain will um, very significantly improve its score. And then finally, for equality bodies, uh, policies where Spain has a very weak equality body. The equality body entered into functions only in 2009, which is very late, um, taking into account the date for implementation of the directives. Um, but now there will be a new equality body being in, in implemented and set up. So that will also improve the score of Spain. So we see here how a legal framework and the adoption and, and pushing for further legal changes can significantly improve a score. Now Spain has a score of 49. With the changes I mentioned, Spain will get a score of 61, which, which is then um, beyond the, above the EU average of 59 that, um, uh, that and, and then Spain will be uh, ranked 15 in the total ranking. Um, that legislation will be, is foreseen to be adopted by the end of this year. Um, another example would be Poland, where Poland uh, has been very much criticized for her lack of implementation of the racial equality directive. There is no equality body, and the directive has been implemented only in the field of employment. Just looking at the, only the, the changes that will be introduced by also a new legislation uh, that will extend the anti-discrimination um, legislation on the grounds of racial and ethnic origin, religion and belief, and nationality uh, outside the field of employment, but also, so also covering education, social protection, access to goods and services, we see that Poland will get a score of 100 for all those indica indicators here mentioned. So Poland, with um, those, only those changes um, regarding the fields of application, will uh, improve his, its score from 36 to 57. So again, we see here an example of a, full impl like a correct implementation of the EC directives that can uh, give you a um, higher score uh, with MIPEX3. So those were examples, like very um, examples for, for, for some countries, and for Germany that could be the case as well, where we know already, we know that um, equality body, the equality body in Germany is is weak, but also the fact that the equality body has no um, legal standing in courts. So those are things that could be pushed for. Uh, in order to improve the, the German legislation and so to improve um, migrants' legal conditions, not to be discriminated against. Um, the overall uh, weaknesses um, identified in the EU are that uh, improvement is still to be made with regard to effective enforcement and access to justice. That's a common, a general 
uh, criticism that can be done for um, almost all member states, EU member states. If we take the Irish example, for instance, um, we see that effective enforcement and access to justice has been very much undermined due to the cuts in fundings. Um, we have now in, Ar in Ireland a lack of financial and human resources, so it means that now there's a huge backlog of cases uh, waiting to be proceeded in courts. Uh, you get uh, victims receive no or little assistance or financial assistance or uh, the um, aid of interpreters or um, also that the procedures are uh, long and so it takes a lot of time to get um, your case being proce uh, processed with. And the uh, other main um, weakness that has been identified also in most countries are with regard equality um, policy. Um, here we see that, for instance, Italy or Malta have a very, a very um, low score. That's because the equality bodies uh, have a mandate only on the grounds of uh, racial or ethnic origin, and they have no competence whatsoever on the grounds of nationality or religion or belief. Uh, we also see that uh, Austria has uh, uh, an average score, well, which is not really that, that good, uh, because there's a problem in Austria in terms, as I said, with both access to justice and equalities, equality bodies. There's a problem of, as regard, with regard to the sanctions being applied and also the visibility of the equality bodies because you have, um, with the system in Austria, you have equality bodies um, at the decentralized levels as well. And so victims, they usually don't know that they can go to those equality bodies uh, to get, um, to, in order to receive some uh, legal assistance. Um, there's also the problem with regard to equality bodies in general, um, with regard to the independence of equality bodies, usually uh, because of the funding that is allocated to those bodies or also the way the um, people working in those equality bodies are nominated or, or, or chosen. And also, um, and that is one of the main problems, and also that's totally related to the access of justice, is that the equality bodies have, um, are usually very weak due to the fact that they have no means to provide assistance to the victims. Um, so those are the main findings, and that uh, applies, applies in general in the EU, but um, particularly in Germany. So also here, there's uh, like room for maneuver for you if you want to push uh, for further changes um, as with regard to the, to the national legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking with the time and giving a good overview, you know. Andreas, it's your turn, please. I will give you now a short kind of introduction into the INA shadow reporting. And Bashi already talked about a little bit about INA, so I won't talk about INA itself, but kind of the shadow reporting system we have implemented over the last, let's say, nine years. And then in the second way, I will give you some results which basically go in line with the MIPEX results. And thirdly, I will give you some recommendations of the report. Uh, the INA shadow reporting uh, was introduced in 2009, and uh, INA is a network of 700, about 700 NGOs all over Europe in all EU countries. So we have a wide range of network organizations which can give information and transmit information uh, from the ground. And uh, on Monday, that's why I have the first pre-release, and Monday is uh, the International Day Against Racism, and there will be the launch of the European Shadow Report, and as well the launch of 27 national reports in each of the countries. So we, you will get more information on Monday, so look in the press, look on our website, ina-eu.org, where you find further information about your specific country and uh, the EU report. So as I said, 
we published the shadow report since 2002 and tried to improve the whole system since then. They are a compilation of grassroots data co uh, collected by a large network of NGOs. The shadow report, why it's called shadow report, it explores the shadows, that's why we call it like that, of the official policies which are normally highlighted. So you know the image is policy and governments highlight their policies in a good light and we look what's in the shadow there, what they don't talk about. So it's based on 27 national reports. The countries are basically similar to the MIPEX study, but without, of course, Norway, Canada, the US, and Switzerland. But we have uh, kind of, because Croatia is going to join the EU, we already have incorporated Croatia. So there's an interesting report on the situation on Croatia coming up this year for the first time. We report in similar areas as the MIPEX studies. That's employment, labor market, education, and it's always under the perspective of anti-discrimination. And we cover as well the other areas as housing, health, access to goods and services, poli policing, racist violence, and media uh, in certain other areas. Policies like family reunion, political participation, long-term residence, access to nationality are covered under topics as well. So we have a different structure of reporting the system, but always under the perspective of anti-discrimination. The shadow reports, they report on vulnerable groups, so we describe the groups. We don't measure like MIPEX do, we describe more from a grassroots perspective. We describe manifestations, so you find in each of the shadow reports manifestations on how uh, racism looks like on the ground in different areas. And we analyze from a grassroots perspective as well the political and legal context. And afterwards, we give some recommendations nationally from an NGO perspective. Those are then kind of summarized and analyzed on a European perspective, and we try to make a synthesis of all those 27 reports in our EU uh, shadow report. There we find this year as well, it was already mentioned, an important impact of the race directives to outlaw discrimination on the basis of, by, of ethnicity and skin color. We realized, and that was already mentioned, that infringement notices actually lead to improvement. That was true for Malta, Lithuania, and Italy. Those countries were already mentioned in the MIPEC study. But we have to take in consideration that those improvements mostly affect the wording of the laws, as it was mentioned for Romania and Bulgaria, because for, access, uh, for the access, they really had to come up with very good laws. But now once they are in, the European Union doesn't have really a lot of means to kind of make sure that those standards are really implemented on the ground. So uh, we have the impression that once they are in the club, the kind of uh, the effort to get active on the field diminishes a little bit. Uh, the practical points, and this was mentioned as well, is that uh, a lot of people on the ground don't really know of the laws in each of the countries. The relevant institutions, like you mentioned in Spain and other countries, they're not really accessible or poorly accessible. And there is often when it's kind of very, and that has something to do with independencies, uh, when it's kind of integrated into the general bureaucracy, uh, the, it restricts the access to rights as well because it's overburdened by bureaucratic procedures. Increasingly uh, visible in Europe is as well the negative public perception, not only in Germany, but in other countries as well. That was already mentioned in different other talks. And uh, it's an effect all over Europe, and that really kind of affects the migrant and the position on the ground as well, and makes them, we already had it as well, to kind of second-class citizen. And that's kind of the perception of the people themselves, that they're not really treated equal. They're kind of a second-class citizen. What do we recommend? To develop and uh, further explore the data collection to, uh, to include an adequate policy development. I think that's a really important work what MIPEX does because it informs policies and gives, uh, gives information to policymakers how to steer their decisions, how to create policies on that ground. So we further have to improve this system from all different perspectives, from an NGO perspective, because I think our strength is really to bring in the perspective from the ground, 
of each of the countries, but as well from think tanks, from sci uh, scientists, universities, and other, uh, other institutions to get a coherent picture of the development in the anti-discrimination field. And uh, the, for us, I think the, uh, we have now finished now the reporting period was finished on the 31st of September last year and since then we are kind of editing the whole report and uh, making the European report. So we couldn't kind of take into consideration the MIPEX results. But what we definitely do in the next year is kind of reflect the MIPEX results with our, in each of our uh, member organizations. So you will get in the next uh, shadow reporting system, some kind of assessment, what is going on on the ground as well, and how does that uh, uh, reflect with the, uh, or affect with the MIPEX uh, indicators. So MIPEX for us is very important. Uh, I think, or we think, that uh, we have to continue the mainstreaming of anti-discrimination and equality concerns in all areas of the policy in the EU and on a national level to kind of create a policy coherence and uh, to measure the impact of equality. I mean, uh, I didn't prepare very much on Germany, but we can probably go into the discussion f later on on the German situation. I have some material here as well. But there is kind of, I mean, there are improvements in Germany, but I think we still need to kind of have a more coherent approach because of the, our federalist system because there's things going on on the federal level. We have the anti-discrimination body, they develop policies, but on the lender level we have a divergence of different policies and there needs to be a Korean approach which is in line with European uh, approaches as well. And last but not least, I would say that the Commission and the Fundamental Rights Agency should play, continue to play an important role in monitoring the whole process. You probably might be aware that we have the focal points uh, of the FRA, the former European Monitoring Center on Racism in Vienna. This should be continued and the work the Commission does in kind of being the guardian of the treaty, more or less. Uh, should be kind of continued and I think uh, the analysis which MIPEX gave that the pressure from top, from, uh, from the European level, the infringement procedures, and the pe uh, pressure from button, from uh, NGOs, really kind of is a, what you call it, a good team to kind of make, uh, create effective policies. Because otherwise we wouldn't have an anti-discrimination equal treatment act in Germany, uh, wouldn't be there. It would be kind of still in the debate. But with the infringement procedure, we got enough power to force the government to kind of finally implement the, uh, the Equal Treatment Act. So I think that's all, and I'm done with less than 10 minutes. Huh? Thank you, Andreas. Uh, we have a lot of questions to you, so you will have uh, enough time. So, and now is the Austrian... Thank you very much for having me here and being able to give a statement from the part of the city of Vienna and also relate the MIPEX results to Austria. Um, we heard that the case is rather a poor one and this of course I deplore very much but I welcome very much uh, critical studies and critical comments that may help us from the state and government bodies to uh, improve our legislation and policies. Um, on a general note, uh, and uh, principally speaking, I want to say that for the Austrian public debate, uh, a project like MyPEX is extremely important because it really shifts the focus away from what immigrants have to do and how they should behave and what values and norms they have. So get away from this culturalist approach and really shift focus on state policies, state regulations, uh, where obstacles are created or opportunities are um, included and given. I think that's very important. I give you a small example from the Austrian debate. We had in 2009 um, a kind of comprehensive approach, a comprehensive process going on um, developing a national plan for integration where all the stakeholders from the state level, national level, federal levels and in the end, also the NGOs were included, a bit late though. Um, and when you see the output uh, and the results of this national plan, which is rather comprehensive, 
The one thing that is really left out is the, the matter of legislation. So you don't have anything in it about, you know, immigration law, citizenship law, anti-discrimination legislation. And this, I think, says kind of everything about how the debate is going on in Austria. So that's why I welcome very much the focus of the MIPEX. And um, I think that the design, the indicators, uh, has been very thoroughly developed and is very valid. Um, I can see that, of course, also from the results for Austria. Although they are um, rather weak, I'm, unfortunately, I have to agree. I mean, this is what uh, the state of things uh, on the legislative level is. Um, what, um, what the MIPEC states on Austria is that it took a minimalist approach. Uh, we um, had, for the first time in 2004, uh, anti-discrimination uh, legislation introduced. And if it were not for the EU directives, I... I'm afraid we still would not have legislation uh, to uh, prohibit um, discrimination in Austria. So we have a long way to go, but it's a start. And there is a lot of very engaged uh, people working in the field, also in the equality bodies, but of course uh, the NGO level and uh, organizations, migrant organizations, do a lot to kind of push uh, government um, on all levels to go further. And they really focus a lot on um, the debates that are going on on the European level and following very closely uh, the discussions about uh, improving also EU law and EU directives, ex extending the scope um, of application, which I think is a very important issue also. Um, what I also found very interesting, and I did a little uh, playing with the data that uh, MIPEX uh, allows, and you can very um, well see uh, which areas of weakness there are in your country and, of, of course, in Austria. And um, I have just put down, because um, I think this is something I can totally agree, where Austria should improve. Um, um, concerns, first of all, the definitions and concepts. We would have to extend the definition of, this, um, of this, the applicability of um, discrimination uh, with regard to religion, we have to outlaw discrimination on the basis of religion. Right now it's only on ethnic uh, origin. And of course it would be great to have nationality also, also but I think that's uh, probably an illusion to, to go as far in Austria or to strive that far. Um, we should have to um, include the concept of a discrimination by association. So if you are the spouse or the relative of someone who is discriminated and ha you have advantages yourself, that this is also uh, covered by the law, I think is very important. There has been an important case at the European level, uh, Coleman, and um, I will say a few words to Vienna because Vienna has already taken that into its uh, legislation. And it's very important to have efficient uh, enforcement mechanisms. The equality bodies sh should have full uh, legal and independent standing and should have a strong mandate to bring cases, to have also kind of alternative, alternative um, dispute resolution mechanisms, I think is very important. Extended, uh, the sanctions should be extended, um, and also the NGOs uh, or NGOs should give a much stronger standing to support uh, victims and also represent victims in court. Something like class action would also be a very big advantage in bringing forward cases and giving or taking a bit away the, the, the heavy burden of fighting discrimination from the individual. I think that would be a very, very important means to improve uh, Austrian legislation. And all this can clearly be followed in the, in the MIPEX uh, indicators and strands, which I really like very much because you can clearly point uh, to the deficits and the uh, uh, requirements and needs that there are for improvement. Um, on a maybe cr a bit critical note, or let's say to give more additional information, uh, information on Austria to make the picture a, more, a bit more complex, uh, we have uh, state legislation not only on the, on the national level, but also on the level of all nine federal provinces. Um, Vienna is one of, of these. So we have two um, uh, laws at the state level, at the national level, and eight more laws at the federal level. And eight, in eight of these provinces, the, the law and legislation goes farther uh, than the national one. So that may slightly re reverse the picture of Austria. And then, of course, at the level of the, fed of the federal provinces, a lot, a lot of 
projects and measures and policies in the field of integration and diversity is going on, much, much more so than uh, at state level, I have to say. And it would be important to have a look at that. Um, the um, Vienna uh, Anti-Discrimination Act is a good example that legislation can go uh, farther at federal level. Although there is the problem of visibility, as you said, definitely so. Uh, the equality body is very hidden and not easily to find, so that's a critique from my part. We have to improve that, definitely. We have to improve our information policies. Um, and uh, another field that is, I think, very interesting with uh, regard to the case of Vienna, and it's mentioned in the MIPAX as a kind of um, contextual information. Vienna has been, since uh, 2004, um, establishing um, diversity policies. Uh, it has made kind of a clear commitment to driving its policies further away from talking about uh, deficits and the negative impacts of immigration and the social problems that may occur with it onto a real uh, positive stance, um, considering diversity um, big potential and uh, wealth and richness for society. And of course, it takes a lot of action to make sure that these potentials can uh, be, um, that the individuals and also society can uh, make use of these potentials. What we are actually doing um, is we're trying to have, um, or that's what, where my department comes in, integration and diversity. We are there. We were uh, founded in 2004. And we are there uh, to uh, support uh, the administrative structures to um, make uh, administration um, or the services that our administration delivers uh, equally accessible to all, uh, make sure that it meets the needs of a diverse population. And also, and that's a very clear goal in my opinion, uh, the City of Vienna strives that its uh, personnel, its staff, uh, becomes a mirror of the Vienna population in its composition. Um, so this is, in a way, it's a very clear positive action. It's not legally binding, it's not in the, in the law, but it's, in a, it's a very clear political statement. And I think we are very much at the beginning, although we have been doing or we have been uh, working in that field since 2004, and very much has to be done. But of course, the political commitment is very important. Um, the structure is there. We have a department. Uh, the discussion evolves also around whether this is uh, sufficient, whether there should be uh, some kind of steering um, body or steering um, um, uh, obligation at the level of the, of the um, municipal administration at the, at the top, because we are doing our work kind of on the same eye level with other departments, which has a, a big advantage, because people may be more open, and we are tr striving to kind of convince them from the advantages that this approach, this diversity approach can bring about, um, that all of, of uh, us people working in the administration can really take advantage of such an approach. Um, but of course you need the steering capacities uh, also and the steering obligation from the top. So there is something where I see um, improvements uh, necessary. And um, what we are also doing, and I think that also is an expression for our clear commitment, we are, uh, have uh, started a monitoring process of these diversity policies in 2007. The first report was published in 2010. It's an integration and uh, diversity monitoring, where the first part is kind of dealing with the overall situation of the immigrant population in comparison with the native population in all fields that are important uh, for integration, labor market, education, social um, situation, health, and so forth, housing. And the second part really deals with the policies and the measures this, that the city itself is taking. We want to get a, a, a clearer, clearer picture of what is really going on in all of the administration because we have some 65,000 uh, staff in Vienna, so it's a very, very uh, large administration. And a lot is, a lot is going on uh, within it uh, that we even do not know of. So we want to get a picture and we want to visualize it. We have developed a diversity scorecard and we want to follow up on it uh, in a, a two, uh, two year, uh, on a two-year basis, annual basis, to see what improvements are being made. So I think that's a, a good start, but 
really a start and we have a long, long way to go. But I have to say that I like the approach and I think it's a very useful one. And um, maybe with regard as, an, as a recommendation to MIPEX, uh, such developments and things at the federal, if there is a strong federalist uh, structure in a country, these levels could maybe be uh, considered a bit more, maybe in the way of adding contextualizing information or something like that. Um, and a kind of recommendation to uh, the National Debate of Austria is definitely put the focus on uh, the areas that the MIPEX is covering. And I am very glad uh, to have such an instrument to support me to, to, or us uh, to uh, shift that debate uh, away from what the immigrants have to do and should do and how they should assimilate to the structural uh, requirements that a receiving society really has to fulfill. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, now you have heard three uh, speakers, uh, one from a think tank, yeah, I understand, and one from NGO perspective, and of course, one from a practitioner perspective from city of Vienna. It's a pity that uh, the, the man we should have been asking a lot of questions is not here, the, the director general from DG Employment, uh, Mr. Holthaus, couldn't come. Um, and, and I think that um, that makes uh, a debate a little bit more one-sided. I would have appreciated if he was here, because there are a lot of things the commissioner and the EU commission could explain, which uh, normally you know people in our position is very difficult to to uh, to talk about. But having said that, I think there are two couple of things which I wanted to uh, the speakers to highlight. One thing is this whole issue of diversity. Because uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the findings, you know, it's very little connection between anti-discrimination policies, practices, and how does it impact on the society, and how does it hinders the society to be a diverse society. And when I talk about diversity, I'm not talking about eating donut kebabs or listening to Bob Marley, you know. That is not, uh, in my eyes, uh, you know, the case of diversity, what I understand uh, the idea of diversity is that the majority societies not only acknowledge that Europe is no longer a monocultural, monoethnic society or continent, but also that states actually proactively promote anti-discrimination policies and they include equal rights on all uh, levels uh, of, of, uh, of the society. And they should also give concrete support, and be responsible when things don't go right. And that fits very well, unfortunately, with what is happening in Europe today. Out of 27 EU countries, 19 countries have right-wing governments. And when I say right-wing governments, I mean anti-minority governments who are absolutely not in the mood to listen to what Commission says, or listen to what NGOs are saying, or even listen to the morality and ethics of a society and how society should be run. And that is why you have heard uh, both uh, from think tank and from NGOs that there is a great lack of willpower, political willpower, that there are many politicians and political parties. For them, anti-discrimination is a city in Russia. You know, it just should not be touched. And I think that it's, it's a sad thing because if... Commission comes up with fantastic directives, and they come up with fantastic guidelines. But if on national levels, there is all the efforts to not only not implement them maximum as the directives ask, but to the minimum levels, but also to raise barriers that the implementation and transposition is barely visible, that is a problem for us, you know. And I think here I will uh, open the, the floor and uh, take one or two questions at a time. Uh, but please uh, ask directly the question, uh, not long comments, but direct question to, to um, Mrs. Doe and to Andrea, or if you want to, to ask about practices in, in Vienna. So ask the question directly to to person, or if you have a question to all panel, of course, but there are three different perspectives. So uh, I have Madame here, and 
Is anybody else? No. Okay. We start with you. Oh, sorry. I'd like to ask Ms. Doe about the information, the detailed information. Is there more information than, this in, than in our uh, report here? I see a very good sort of structural information about the qu uh, criteria that was being judged, but the individual indicators at the national level are not self-evident from this report. Is there any way that we could have access to that? I say that because especially the field of positive action, it would be very valuable to see the relationship because that's where I think anti-discrimination and diversity come together uh, and uh, because it is an equality. Um, we do have some work in Germany that despite the weaknesses of the anti-discrimination legislation and, uh, for the individual and all the barriers that have to be uh, overcome to be able to bring your case to court because people are not well enough informed, because they do not believe that this system works. They've been used to discrimination for so long that they don't try because they don't have a support system, et cetera, et cetera. Despite that, a diversity uh, approach is potentially a larger base for long-term planning and uh, a protection from discrimination to begin with if we really set it like the Viennese have talked about setting it and we're trying to do in Berlin. Uh, our Landes anti-discrimination uh, organization is doing much to uh, even uh, work on potential of change in the local public authority okay. with respect to uh, diversity policies. So I would like to know, can we get more information from you on this? Okay. We are coming to Please. Yeah, I have a question concerning uh, certain types of employer behavior and how they should, how it, they should be considered. You know, there's a bunch of studies that show, for instance, that immigrants that, who've changed their name have a higher chance of getting employed. Now, is that, is, is, you know, is discriminating on the basis of name is this bad? Uh, I mean, it's clearly employers are using a change of name as a proxy measure for something there. I mean, you can change your name, but you can't change your appearance. You see? So, I mean, uh, should we make those kinds of distinctions when we're talking about discrimination? Now, it's true that when you discriminate on the basis of name, it has the same consequences, the point I made, as discriminating on the basis of, if you want, racism or taste, whatever you want to call it. Okay. okay? So that, that's the point I want to make here. I mean, there are, I mean, there's a, there's a, a study, in, for instance, in, in Sweden that shows that people who've changed their names completely from an ethnic name to whatever, Anderson, Pearson, uh, you, you, you look at their wage developments uh, and their wages increase relative to people who haven't changed their names. Now, again, there's nothing, they've not changed themselves fundamentally. They're still ethnic. They're still the same. I mean, you can see that when you interview them. And yet, changing something, you know, I mean, what are employers doing there? They're, they're making a decision based on not something that's, that's essential, may be considered by the immigrant, that their name is part of their identity, but nevertheless, okay. So how should we consider or treat this kind of behavior by employers? Okay. And who is this question directed to? Well, I guess it's directed to, to, to anyone here, basically. Wonderful. Uh, okay. Okay. So, Mrs. Doe, please. Um, yeah, so I hear you, you in the MIPEX, in the book, you um, have just like a short brief on, on the results, but what you can do is go on the website uh, that is very well built up and where you can actually play with the, um, the scores for your country and also you see all the indicators like individual indicators so where you can you can see the the, the type of questions that has been asked to the experts and the peer reviewers but also um, how um, like the, the different questions that goes into the different dimension and then for you for equality policies you can see here much more information that what has been detailed in the in the book so yeah I don't know is it is it a yep Probably coming back to your question on uh, employers' behavior. Uh, 
I mean, there are not a lot of studies around, but they slowly emerge, at least in Germany, where I have the most overview, I think. Uh, and there has been a study similar to what you presented from the University of Constance, which exactly had the same results, that those who have an ethnic name, Turkish, basically Turkish name, got, uh, don't have the figures in mind, but get dramatically less employed than uh, others with German native names. Then, I think the problem there is... Uh, I mean, there are different strategies I think people have in dealing with discrimin discriminatory behavior and kind of changing your name is a very defensive, individualized approach. So we have stories collected where people say, don't write my Turkish name on my business card. He was an architect because if there is my Turkish name there, so he made up some, fir uh, some enterprise name because if they see my name, I cannot buy windows with, uh, at a window seller, so I cannot uh, go to a carpenter because then they treat me differently. So one, uh, one reaction is then to uh, kind of so find an individual solution to kind of solve it in an individual way. Another approach is kind of what the German anti-discrimination body is doing, which I thought is very encouraging about the anonymous application, which follows more or less the American model that you hand in application without any photographs and without names and purely with your qualification. So that would kind of probably make the uh, the selection procedure more, I call it more fair probably. But I think uh, the problem you're referring to is kind of, I mean, uh, it's a problem of big firms who have, let's say, 2,000 applications for one job and then they have 10 jobs to uh, give. And I think that's where they have those kind of really great, uh, uh, what you call it, is it really digital criteria in names or school, uh, school references and things like that where they kind of make a pre-selection. So they don't, uh, they lose out anyway. They lose potential because nobody knows uh, what kind of potential they lose in that sense. So there we have to work with the firms. We have to kind of uh, uh, monitor their selection procedure and things like that and make them aware that they're harming themselves if they proceed like that because they lose loads of potential in that way then. So probably there's not one answer, but probably four or five or something, like the different approaches we need to do. Uh, I wanted to add something to your uh, question, because uh, it's, I think it's a very important one. And from the point of view of the city of Vienna, I mean, we have both. We have anti-discrimination legislation and an equality body that is very hidden. Uh, and we have a diversity approach and diversity policies that is kind of rather separate from each other. And there I see a big problem because it seems uh, to be discrimination is a taboo. Uh, and if you don't touch upon the issue and call it by its name, then how, uh, how are you, uh, will you be able to get rid of it? So I think the diversity poli policies have to be firmly based on a clear understanding what discrimination is and how it, how it has to be um, kind of fought and how it has to be addressed. And it has to be kind of an integrated approach. Actually, we lack that in Vienna. And there I see a, a, a big uh, structural problem. And maybe also to your question, um, I, I, I didn't quite understand uh, the, um, the difference that you make um, when you say uh, these, um, I mean, it's discrimination because of the name which leads to discrimination because of ethnic origin, because of origin. In my, in my view, I, I, can't, I can't clearly make this difference, you know, um, because what goes with it and what goes with uh, the, the, diff the, the foreign name or foreign sounding name is the picture that we have uh, in the majority society of groups, the generalizing, the stereotyping, uh, where you think this person uh, is not that capable, is not that qualified, is not... So why do you make that difference that I would like to know? And what, and how, yeah, that is not clear to me. Would you like to expand on that? Okay. Yeah, no, the point, the point really is that, you know, if you change, if, you know, if, if there's a change characteristic of the individual, the employer behavior changes. See? The person hasn't changed their ethnic origin. They've changed their name. Okay. Okay. 
does one still know? Does one still know what the origin is? Well, yes. when the, when the interview occurs, certainly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This is. I mean, it's a. It's. I think it's a difficult situation to deal with because, uh, as I say, it's a. There's no fun. It's the same thing with the acquisition of nationality. Mm. Why? Why does that increase? If you put aside public service, why does that increase uh, the probability of employment? Is it because the individual has changed? Well, something has changed in them. Has their behavior changed? Or is it because the employer's behavior all of a sudden changes? So I'm not dealing with a foreigner anymore. This one has made a commitment to the country. Is that, is that what he's, what's going through his mind? I will answer you because I asked some Turkish people who are a little bit fair color and who uh, just to come to an interview, they use contact lenses, blue contact lenses. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's happened. And that the first hurdle that if an application comes where it says Mohammed Chelik or Bashi Qurashi, they will just throw it in the dustbin. They will not even entertain it. So some people who have good qualification, who wants to just to come to the interview, use this tactic. And once they come in there, then the employer has to interview them. And once you sit in front and talk nice and show your qualification, and then half the hurdle is gone. So I think it is more a psychological hurdle than to, to deplore their own identity. You know? But it is not a new thing. In 1970, when I came to Denmark, I applied for a job. And I, I have an American degree. I came to this guy, and he looked at the, my degree, and he said, Mr. Qureshi, and this is exactly what he said. Your qualifications are OK, but you have a wrong color. So I asked, I said, I have a beautiful color. Why do you say I have a wrong color? <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. Don't misunderstand me. The problem is that we have not invited people like you to work as engineers. We have invited people like you to come and wash our dishes. And this you know, mindset is very still in the employer's mind. And just to get this to, to that hurdle, that is what that tactic is being used. That is my understanding from that. Uh, yeah, I, I would also like to refer to examples that we can find in other countries where you have um, diversity approach um, that have le led to um, the adoption of codes of conduct, for instance, where the employers are well committed themselves to um, for recruitment procedures, for instance, to 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 implement diversity in their own company. And the French authority, the French Equality Authority, La Alde, um, managed also to have agreements with um, many companies in France so to have anonymous uh, recruitment procedures. So th those are yeah, strategies that can be, uh, well, those give us examples of um, approaches. Thank you, Do. Gentlemen there. Um, meine Frage wäre, ob Sie um, Möglichkeiten sehen. Okay, I can. Uh, ob, uh, ob das Panel Möglichkeit sieht, die Debatte ein Stück weit von, dem, von der Antidiskriminierungspolitik als etwas Negativen, als eine Maßnahme gegen etwas uh, zu verändern, hin zu Zu der, zu der Diversität als etwas, das, die, das für alle gut ist, das die Produktivität der Gesellschaft steigert. Vielleicht konkret die Frage an Frau König. Arbeiten Sie mit Unternehmen zusammen, mit denen Sie zeigen können, dass die Diversität, die Produktivität der, des Unternehmens steigert und somit als Vorbild dienen können? Yes, of course, I will answer in English. Thank you for the question. Um, that is what we are trying to do in Vienna. We try to kind of, uh, ch we try to change the paradigms that we have in our uh, situation uh, in Vienna, um, promote um, diversity as a positive concept, promote it as something that is, has gains for uh, the whole society, but um, in practice, um, of course, you have to face structural barriers, structural uh, problems. You have, to ha you have to deal with negative aspects, of course. Um, so I always find it difficult to, to, make or to, to uh, overcome that 
gap somehow. Yeah? Because diversity policies can only be efficient if you have a firm, a firmly, a firm equality policies. And if your understanding of that is very clear, because I cannot say diversity is very nice if, I don't know, 30% of the population with an immigrant background or even more um, are in a very disadvantaged social position. You know, I mean, that does not go together. So we have to go, I think, a very long way uh, to, and this, I think, is, is, is the topic of the whole conference, how to enable social mobility for those who are in a more uh, disadvantaged position. And then you can celebrate, I mean, it's not a, a, a linear process, but one and the other uh, uh, is, is uh, dependent from each other, and you can't uh, celebrate diversity if you don't look at the social um, inequalities. So, and uh, we do not yet uh, work with firms, I, I have to admit, because in our own um, administration there is so much to do. You know, we, can't, we cannot yet be a positive example. We cannot say... Uh, this is what we have found out and this is the gains that we had. And very much or very often you cannot even uh, measure it in economic terms. You know? On the short run and the mid run you have to invest yeah? because there is social inequalities. I cannot say let's celebrate diversity and then we are even getting more wealthy maybe in the, just in one step. That, that's not possible in my opinion. The interesting thing is that many employers in Europe, once they employ ethnic minorities, they're very happy because they don't drink so much. They come in time at work, and you know they, they're very happy. And even in my country, Denmark, uh, one, there had been survey where employers said we were very skeptical, but once we had a good experience, then actually they were discriminating the Danish, you know, in, in hiring <laughs> ethnic minority workforce because they were a very stable workforce. So this basic hurdle is a big problem. Not once you get into to workforce, you know, uh, they intend to stay or they stay, you know. Okay, so, uh, yes, I, I have first the lady there with the red sweater. Um, I have a question for Mr. Hieronymus. Uh, last night I read in the news that uh, there was a change in the Ausländerrecht in the Bundestag. Uh, there was a new decision about the newly arrived uh, immigrants that they have to pass the integration course exam in order for their residence permit, Aufenthaltserlaubnis, uh, to prolong. And uh, so actually I'm interested in your opinion. How Can you comment on it and to what extent this uh, is going to, imp uh, to have a negative impact then on the newly arrived immigrants? Thank you. And a lady there, please. I would like uh, to add an aspect concerning social mobility. Um, for example, if you look at young Turkish kids here in Berlin, I take care of a teenager, a Turkish boy, teaching him German in my flat, and uh, I'm training him to get rid of his typical Turkish accent, although he has been born here in Berlin, of course, has been living here for 18 years already. And I always tell him, as long as you speak this typical Turkish sub language or social lect or whatever you could call it, you will have problems. Um, I think um, I would like to know what, um, what is done about that, because if you go to Kreuzberg or whatever they have, these kids have their own language. Um, yeah? I'm coming now. You're having many hands. Just a minute. So, uh, the first question was to you. Uh, I don't know if it's a difficult question or not, but I think it's one of those what you call the conservative dilemmas they try to solve here in Germany. That once you admit it that you're an, uh, that you're an immigration society, how can you create a policy to keep everybody out? So that's basically the same thing. And what they did is kind of they cut the money. I think last year they cut the money for the language courses last year. And now they kind of say if you don't pass a language course, uh, you, don't get your, uh, you only get one year permit, I think it was. That's a discussion, something. And that yesterday they changed in, in the parliament. So uh, I think it's this typical type of problem solutions of conservatives. Uh, and it's like in school earlier on that you 
pull your egg, uh, leg out, let the other tumble and say, why are you tumbling? Something like that, so it's an unfair policy. But I don't really know if it has much effect because it's really symbolic. It's trying to, I mean, we have elections now, a couple of elections coming out, and it's trying to mobilize the conservative, uh, the conservative electorate. So that's it's all, all about. I don't know, I mean, uh, on the ground we will see how it will affect, but uh, anyway, too, uh, too little money in the integration courses, the teachers are too, much, uh, too little paid, so we have problems anyway with this law, without this law. So I don't know if it really has effects on the ground. And to, to the second point, to the language thing, accent. to the accent, I mean, that's what you come across, that a lot of people, if they're, even if they're uh, kind of uh, professors at university, that uh, kind of I always say the national identity of Germans is not a nation state in one way, it's their language and it's building education. So there, uh, if you don't speak uh, German in a specific way, you always will have problems. On the other hand, we are a country which lives from very diverse dialects, social acts, and things like that. And if you see, uh, for example, we did research in Hamburg about language acquisition of, um, in multicultural areas. Young people create their own language, and that's what we kind of listen, probably, in public transport. So the problem uh, probably is not like that. Uh, okay, if you talk like that, it's not very uh, useful if you want to get a credit or if you want to get a job, but they have a right to use that language in a certain area, in a certain remit. And what we need to do for language acquisition is to kind of enlarge the way, like everybody needs to learn, you need to uh, communicate in a different way with, when you are in a bank, when you work in a workplace, when you're talking with your mother, when you're talking with your uncle and things like that. So probably it's about kind of how do we communicate in, in, uh, in certain areas. And not about good or bad communication, it's about appropriate communication because it functions, it has a certain function among youth groups. And I think that's totally leg legitimate. And we cannot go about and say, no, that's not the proper German you're talking. But what we need to learn is kind of that it's not appropriate to speak like that when you're applying for a job or if you kind of are in school or things like that. So probably this differentiation of domains in language to have a feeling for that. So that's my personal opinion now. Can I ask the lady the question, who asked the question about this Turkish accent? You want them to get rid of Turkish? Is there one uniform accent in Germany? Because uh, if you go to Bavaria, uh, and I don't understand what they say, but in Hamburg, I can understand what they say in German. So mm. what is the criteria of that uniform accent in Germany? Um, his father, the father of this Turkish boy, um, he came from Turkey, he immigrated to Germany. He also has an accent, but this is the typical accent of a foreigner living in this country. The Turkish boy and his comrades, they have another accent. That means he is not able, and that's pretty much the only thing I'm training him to do. He can't say ich, he says ich. Ich habe. And this is... Um, okay. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to tell him you can use this with your friends. It's okay. But if you want, he is, uh, he is taking his final exams and he wants to go to university. I tell him it would be extremely positive if you could get rid of that in certain situations. Okay, okay, thank I'm, you. I'm also not in favor of a, a politician, for example, speaking a very strong dialect. I okay. think you, what okay. you talk at home or how you talk at home is another language. No, fine. Thank you very much. I understand now. Okay, we have, we have many uh, people under... First, the young lady, but don't scold her. Please ask the question, okay? <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm a Turkish native speaker and a linguist. Uh, my comment to this uh, thing, I really have to make it really clear that uh, accents are the accents are like part of the identity it makes people what they are so we can't really uh, force people to get rid of their identity i think it's so wrong and it shouldn't be 
this and uh, the other questions what I really would like to ask is like what is the standard language who is really like speaking the standard language what's standard German or what's standard English I mean we can't just say that people need to get rid of their accent to get like a better place in the universe or in the uh, job area it's, it's I'm sorry but it's ridiculous and it sounds not uh, politically correct. What was your question? Uh, so what is the language policy? There is because there is also like discrimination through the accent and the language. Wonderful. So okay. what, what is the language policy to avoid that? And it's to Mr. Andreas. Yes. Okay, wonderful. One minute, there's other question. The gentleman there, yes please. Question please. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I've been boiling on this one for a while. So, um, question is specifically for Ms. Doe, and it has to do um, with the um, MIPEX and whether it integrates any parts of citizenship and becoming a resident or a citizen in the country itself. Um, and the example that I would use maybe is asylum seekers coming to Germany and the high percentage of them that are often without real, a real answer pretty much just sent on their way. Um, I think, I mean, that may have something to do with discrimination in my mind as an American, so. Should we have a uniform Deutsche Reichsdeutsche? <laughs> I mean, it's a very difficult, and you see the reactions, it's very emotional point language, and that's my point, it's, that's the national identity thing. If you talk about language in German, we talk about German national identity. Things. That's the first point I want to make. But I want to uh, kind of make a no European approach and say uh, we can be from, I'm from, uh, I'm from Stuttgart, but I'm living since 25 years in Hamburg, and it took me uh, my university life to learn a little bit of the dialect there, and I still have a strong dialect. So I'm not really very much integrated into Hamburg when, when, uh, when you look at it language-wise. And people notice that, and uh, this gives a certain type of interaction then. But on the other hand, kind of, I uh, do a lot of work uh, on a European level, so it's necessary to learn, language, uh, to learn English as well. And I don't share the French approach that the whole world is speaking French. <laughs> so uh, we have to kind of find a pragmatical way of communicating with each other. And my personal opinion is Italian would be ideal, because you only need uh, hands with that, so you don't need a much... <laughs> Think that's now a stereotypical type of thing then. But we need to have kind of this, uh, I mean, she, uh, in one way she is right. I would defend her a little bit. We need those different ways of communication for certain domains. And if we kind of, uh, we need to develop English knowledge, we develop German knowledge, we have to develop mother tongue knowledge, and from, uh, from early childhood uh, education, we know that you need to start off in an education in your mother tongue, whatever that is in, at home. And then we have to build on. So we have to kind of really make a, a multilingual language policy or something like that, which, which uh, shows respect to every form of communication, more or less, that goes beyond kind of just language. It goes beyond uh, uh, kind of difficulties, for example, what artists have. Mm -hmm. Artist people, they have a lack of uh, in communication. How do we deal with such? Not everybody is a communicative person, things like that. So we really have to think about this approach. How can we enable everybody to participate in a discourse, in a public sphere? Okay. I think that uh, we are going a little wee bit outside in the discussion we were having, even it's a very important issue. But I think it's very emotional, so it will be very difficult to have that long discussion. Madam, it's okay. We are not attacking you. We just... Uh, the Okay. 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 Thank you for the clarification. Of course. Of course. Uh, Karan. Uh, no. Okay. She. Okay. So now I have uh, the lady here. Uh, please microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh, so, yeah. Sorry. First. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
so concerning citizenship, of course, Mike Beck's tree uh, measures that. So you have um, indicators regarding the number, the number of years a migrant needs to be in a country before getting access to citizenship, and, and that is captured by Mike Beck's tree. Now, for more specifically regarding nationality, as I said before, anti-discrimination on, on the grounds of nationality is, very, is something very... Um, where, where member states till now have uh, are, are weak on the results because nationality is not protected in all countries of the EU. Um, it is citizenship is, as I, again, I, I'm repeating myself, but citizenship has an explicit reference in the UK but not necessarily in the other countries. And also um, one of the main problems is that um, the line between nationality and then ethnicity or eth ethnic origin can be very thin. And so depending on the interpretation given at the national level, uh, for instance in Sweden, um, nationality could be interpreted as overlapping with um, ethnicity. So here again, we, we, it's, uh, at, at the national level, it, it, it can differ. And, and then that's why um, the discourse are different from one country to another. Yes, my name is Felicitas Hillman, University of Bremen. I have a question to Vienna, because you said that you introduced in 2004 your diversity policies, right? And I would like to know which measurements or which masnam, which things you did, worked best with the minority population and which worked best with the majority population, if you could make a differentiation there. We take one more question, is it okay? All right. So I think there was a lady there. <laughs> no, this, your name is here, uh, your, <laughs> your, your appearance is here. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there was this there with the lady with the glasses and behind. Yes, um, sometimes discrimination is not so open and yesterday we talked about school situation and that might be there are some discriminating active activities but not so open in school that also uh, Teachers are not prepared to use diversity in class as a potential, but see it as a problem. And also it was said that teachers are not prepared really to, to, uh, to tackle this. So uh, my question is also to Mrs. Koenig. You are talking about public administration, schools are public institutions. So in your work, have you done some activities regarding this uh, topic? So there was a gentleman in the back. Yes, please. Microphone. Well, f first of all, I wanted to make a comment on the debate about um, that in the, in excellent uh, discussion over here. I feel uh, um, um, very strong about it, so I'll do it in German. Um, also, um, ich glaube. Wait a minute. Ready? Also ich glaube, die, die Diskussion ist ein bisschen missverständlich gelaufen, weil die Dame äh, über einen Akzent geredet hat. Ich selbst bin in äh, berlin wedding aufgewachsen. Ich kenne äh, diesen Dialekt oder diesen Akzent, von dem die äh, Dame gesprochen hat, äh, sehr gut. Das Problem ist... Äh, dieser Dialekt äh, ist nicht entstanden, weil ähm, äh, ja, im, im Zuge einer Identifikation in der Gesellschaft oder Ähnlichem, sondern ähm, es entsteht, weil ähm, Schüler bzw. Jugendliche in diesen ähm, Gegenden, diesen Bezirken einfach kein richtiges Deutsch lernen und sie oft dann auch mit ihren Eltern sprechen, die selbst ja auch noch nicht ähm, ihr Deutsch so perfektionieren konnten. Und es geht tatsächlich auch um falsches Deutsch, also die Grammatik, also Sprache an sich ist ja eine Sache, die sich auch entwickelt und ähm, sie entwickelt sich einfach so weit ähm, falsch auch in diesen Gegenden, dass es letztendlich, ich habe das selbst mitbekommen, ähm, einfach Hürden baut äh, an manchen Stellen in der ähm, Gesellschaft, äh, weil man diese, diesen Dialekt einfach mit einer, mit einer, ja, mit einer, mit einer falschen, mit einer falschen, ja, mit einer falschen Sprache äh, assoziiert. Und ich denke, dahingehend ist es 
Also man kann auch nicht, man kann auch nicht irgendwie etwas falsch äh, weiterentwickeln und dann sagen, das gehört zu meiner Identität. Man sollte sich eher darüber aufregen, dass man äh, es nicht hinkriegt, diesen Leuten in dieser Gegend äh, das Deutsch so beizubringen, dass äh, äh, wie es ursprünglich auch war und wie es dann letztendlich den äh, Jugendlichen auch Türen öffnet äh, in verschiedenen äh, Gesellschaftsschichten, ob es in der, äh, im Privatleben oder im Beruf dann ist. Ja. Okay. Danke schön. Okay. So who will take it up? Okay, Karl. Um, first to the question, um, what kind of experience we have with regard to measures um, with regard to minority versus majority population? Is that what you asked? Um, I, I could not answer in that way we, because we do not make the distinction in that way. Um, what we do, I mean, our measures for welcoming people who come to the uh, country newly are, of, is of course, a, a special uh, kind of, of um, measures uh, to welcome uh, people, to give them information and orientation. Um, that's the one big part, um, uh, kind of welcoming services and orientation and uh, services and language support. And the other area where we are very active in, because we also have offices in the uh, five offices in the, in the most densely populated districts of Vienna, we do a lot on the ground in making people uh, giving um, or um, promoting opportunities that people can meet each other and get to know each other and uh, uh, undertake activities with each other in order to kind of reduce uh, prejudice and um, also give information and kind of try to influence the opinions and the attitudes of people. Um, that's, that is a big focus of our district work. Um, and the diversity policies is actually oriented uh, to the administration itself. So we work uh, within the administration with other departments to support them um, to be able to uh, deliver uh, their services uh, in a good way, in a very qualitative way, and make sure that it's accessible to all the population, regardless of their background. So this is kind of how it's um, um, how it's developed um, over the years. Um, not all of it is very, uh, not all of it is consistent. I have to say, uh, it's it's a, a long long-term process of development since the early 90s, and um, it's and also the effects are not really measured yet. You know, this is something that is very also hard to do, yeah, to, have, to measure the effects of your policies and to measure the effects of your uh, um, measures. Um, the second question was about school uh, and diversity. This is not really in our, within our competence, but of course there's uh, a lot uh, is going on. It's basically federal competence, so the Stadtschulrat uh, uh, for Vienna is taking care of that, and there's um, there has been a lot of initiatives to uh, change the curri curricula in school, you know, to anchor intercultural uh, education, uh, to, to make sure that education is uh, for uh, pupils um, with many different backgrounds, that it's not, you know, cent centered only on uh, a certain uh, uh, view. And um, there is a lot of support also language-wise uh, going on in the schools so that people are, uh, uh, pupils are also uh, supported in learning their first language, their mother tongue, uh, and many projects where things are kind of um, uh, tried. And the problem uh, of recent years is that resources have been cut and also this additional support with teachers has been cut. So we have a lot of increasingly problems in schools, uh, which is rather deplorable deplorable, because in the 90s it was always said that school is one place in society, and especially in Vienna, where integration is really working well, you know, because it's uh, rather uh, a place where all come together and the aim is kind of uh, the same, and the budget and the resources were there, and things were kind of moving in a good direction. I'm certainly, uh, certainly there were problems also, but now there's a, ra a rather big backlash, I have to say, and this okay. is... Deplorable. Thank you, Karen. I am just handed over a, a slip which says 10 minutes remaining, and now it actually is 8 minutes remaining. So I have a lot of people um, on the list, but there is only room for one or two more questions. And um, I would ask first uh, the gentleman here. 
Yes, uh, the microphone, please. Short, precise question, please, okay? No long comments. Um, um, I'm, uh, we have been hearing these um, studies, um, statistics for the past one and a half days, and they're fantastic, but I have a concern here. I mean, my concern is, do these studies reach the public? Number one. Number two is, do they reach the people who are, who are in concern, the immigrants themselves? Are, are they aware of all these um, um, findings we have? Because this is very important um, that uh, we reach them. And in order to reach them, what are the channels? And this is a question to um, um, our speakers, but also to, to the audience. What are the challenges that, uh, the channels that we should use in order to reach these people or we should create in order to reach these people? Um, my other concern is we have been talking about the people, the immigrants. We are talking about them. We are talking for them. Um, and we are making policies for them. But they are not actually involved in making these policies. And sometimes these policies do not meet their expectations. And what I want to suggest is that um, in, in such a meeting, I think we should have one of these people who are accused of being genetically deformed to come here and speak about, um, about what they think, what their expectations are, if these policies will meet their needs or not. Uh, because I think these, um, what worries me is that these studies will end up in, they are um, policy, they inform policy, of course, but how long is it going to take until they inform the policy or the policy makers? And my worry is that they will end up on a shelf collecting dust. So okay. we need to do something with these things. Thank you very much Thank for you. this very important question. We'll come back to the. And the last, this gentleman here, again, you wanted to speak? I want to make a comment. No, not long, because we don't have time for comment. That we can do in the lunchtime, you know. <laughs> So uh, if you don't have any question, because uh, this question the gentleman asked has uh, very long answers from, so I will start with you, with if you have any comment on that, and then we go to the side. Yes, okay. well, thank you. For, I mean, it's a very important question, and of course, it's, it's rather directed to you than to us. I mean, we produce the, the MIPEX, and as, as, as far as we can... I, I mean, to the extent we can present it to, to the outside world is also for the civil society to appropriate the, the tool to themselves and then reach the migrants themselves and also the decision make, makers and, and then to influence policies. I mean, it's, it's the use that you would do with MIPEX3 rather than what we did with it. I mean, we, we, we continue to, to, to work on it, but it's for the advocacy you, you build up upon the, the tool that we produced. So the question is rather to you, how can you reach the migrants then? Very smart move. Okay, Andreas. Uh, could be a long discussion how to involve the people and how to change public discourse. Uh, I think one point would be, of course, uh, kind of being electorate. I mean, if you give people the citizenship and have the right to vote, immediately this course changes because you have to run for their votes. So the policy will be kind of changing in one way because they lose out votes. And so that's what we kind of see slowly happening in Hamburg. More, more people of migrant background are in the parliament, for example, since the last election, the highest number ever. So things will slowly change. That's on the one level. So I think kind of if people have voting rights, that what Mehmet Kilic said, immediately the political discourse is changing as well because they are not object anymore, they are subject of the political discussion. So that's very important in my point of view. The other thing is a long-term perspective and that's what Ina is working on. We currently in our new work program, we try to work out how we can change the narrative in Europe about migration and that's a big problem because in our reports it's clearly stated the narrative about migration, about migrants, about minority people in all countries is kind of very, very uh, negative in that sense. So how can we find ways uh, as a civil society movement and we have uh, different minority and ethnic minority people in our organizations, from Roma, from Jewish people, Muslim people, all the, all the uh, different uh, strands, and 
how we can be involved in, in a process to, ve to develop a narrative which they carry and where they are, are enabled to change this discourse in their constituency, for example, that they can stand up and uh, kind of in Romania, Roma people about arguing about uh, discrimination in school, that they kind of really are empowered to kind of bring forward their point, to say, I think your policy is just shit. Thank, thank you, Andreas. Karl. Uh, thank you for that uh, very important question. Um, as far as I know, uh, MIPEX, or the Migration Policy Group and its partners, is um, actually planning a lot of activities and events in all the member countries. And I think a very good idea would be, for example, for Vienna also to bring the issue and to bring the results uh, to the integration fora that we have, for example, in all the district, just to, to to give, um, to convey the message and to convey the information, because uh, definitely may be hard to find. And I think a lot of talk has to be about it, and a lot of meetings and uh, reunions to just pass it on. I think that's very important. And the the issue of, of participation is an urgent and really urgent one. And uh, part. Uh, a big issue of Vienna's diversity policies would be to have a diverse workforce. You know, we are ve very much at the start, actually. Um, but this is an aim, and it, we have a long way to go, but it's definitely one of the most important things to achieve. Okay. Well, on that very positive note, uh, I would really like to, to thank all the participants and the speaker for their valuable contribution. And I will promise you this gentleman sitting there, excuse me, sir. I will promise you that from in our side, we will make a small report based on weaknesses and strengths, and we will make a campaign to, in all 27 countries where we have coordination, so we are not going to let them sleep very nicely, believe me. <laughs> and uh, I personally, on my, on my own personal capacity, I'm working with two large international organizations, NGO organizations, from Turkey to, to, uh, to Baltic countries, and I travel a lot, and we will take it up in the coming few, and that is our job, to have people who are victim of, of discrimination, to have their voice in, heard, and I hope that Stiftung also will you know, have this campaign wherever they can, so that the victims are empowered, and not only the intellectual and professors. Thank you very much for the interview.